First of all, thank you, Julie, and my Jewish learning. This has become a really fun thing I really look forward to. And many of your names and faces I see coming back every month. It's lovely to be with you and all our new friends too. Um, someone posted, Charlie posted in the chat. Is that the website? That is the website. Exactly. So I teach there and I manage that site. And also uh, a few other people will teach there now too. So there's a bunch of stuff there you can check out at your leisure. Don't do it during the class. There's a great class happening here. Do it some other time. Um, but uh, yeah, that's it. Anyway, lovely to be with you. And I can say here from Israel, where I am, I'm in Beit Zaya outside Jerusalem, Chodesh Tov, a good month, a good moon to you, because here the, the Chodesh, the new moon has indeed started. And here in Israel, we actually see the new moon right away on the night of the new moon. And maybe some of you, wherever you are in the world, that happens to you as well. But when I was living in the States, that never happened to me. I was always catching it like a day or two after. So I don't know exactly why that is. I'm not a trained astronomer, but um, I'm grateful for that. And uh, it's a very exciting month. And as we're going to learn together in a moment on the sheet, thanks for posting that, Julie, um, as well as being the beginning of a new month, it's also a month that has within it a new year, one of our many new years. We have many reminders in Judaism to start over again. Starting over is like a big thing all the time, many, many times in the year and even every day and every moment. And even according to some opinions, as we're going to learn together in a moment, actually today, tonight, the, the first day of the month, which begins on Wednesday night, Thursday, am I getting there right? Yeah, Wednesday night, Thursday. That is um, actually a new year, according to one opinion we'll see together. So I can actually say even Shana Tova, uh, happy new year, a good new year to you as well as everything else. And let's look at the sources and we'll see that together. I'll share my screen so you can, uh, you can see that easily. Okay, so as you'll see, we are gonna talk about the month and a big theme of the month that we'll get to soon is actually eating, hence the title, Saving the World One Bite at a Time. But first we're gonna understand a little bit about where the month is in the calendar and the significance of it and all this business about new years I just mentioned, and especially the new year for trees, which is the new year of our month, uh, when it is, what it is, and again, how it's connected to eating, which is a big theme. So the Mishnah is the first layer of rabbinic law. It's the beginning of rabbinic Judaism as law. And in the Mishnah, right at the beginning of a tractate of a section of the Mishnah called Rosh Hashanah, tells us something pretty awesome. It says here, there are four new years. There's one on the first of Nisan. Nisan is the month we're getting to get to in a couple months' time when Pesach is, Passover. So that, that in a way is a new year we might not find so surprising because it's like spring, new lease of life little baby animals being born and jumping around and so on. It's a pretty logical, intuitive time to have a new year, a new beginning. And also it's right before the exodus of the Jewish people from Egypt, which is, you know, in itself a new beginning. The first of Elul, you may not know about this one. It's not very famous. And today, not many people do much to mark it. Um, it's really, uh, you know, mostly for tax type purposes in the time of the temple, they needed to say, um, what year an animal belonged to. Do you pay tax on the animal to the temple in this year or that year? So for that, you need to have a certain date. If the animal is born after a certain date, it's in this year and so on. So they have a new year for animals. It's the first of Elul. It's interesting, it's exactly a month before the next one it's going to talk about, which is the first of Tishrei, that is Rosh Hashanah. So those of you who have heard of the Jewish New Year, and you know that's the most famous, obvious one, that's the one you're probably most familiar with, if you are familiar. So interesting, the one for the animals is like a month before our one, exactly. Maybe it's some kind of like hint to us to begin to get ready for our own one, maybe. So, and then we see there, uh, the first of Tishrei is a new year for years. That's when we actually count years in the Jewish calendar. We go up a year every Rosh Hashanah, the first of Tishrei every year. And also for sabbatical years and jubilee years, that makes sense because those are counted according to years. So sabbatical year is every seven years, take a year off. Uh, working the land and so on. Jubilee, ju jubilee years is every seven of those seven cycles as an extra year off. So a 50th year, that that's where the idea of a jubilee comes from, releasing debts, releasing slaves and so on. And for planting and for the vegetables. So that all of that depends on the first of Tishrei and Rosh Hashanah. So, so far we had Nisan, spring, bunnies bouncing around, Elul, counting when animals are born, Tishrei, Rosh Hashanah, and now the new year we're talking about in our month, Shabbat. On the first of Shabbat, that is literally today where I am and soon will be where you are, wherever you are, uh, or may already be if you are near where I am, the new year for the trees, according to the words of the house of Shammai, that's one of the schools of rabbinic early rabbis or the early sages, the rabbinic opinion, and then 
according to the House of Hillel, who would love to disagree with them, on the 15th. Now, we always actually follow the opinion of the House of Hillel, not Shammai, uh, which means that we call the Jewish New Year for Trees two Bishvat, and the two actually means 15. It's a tet and a vav, which uh, the letters in Hebrew also have numerical value. So if you put tet and vav together, you get two and 15. So that is two Bishvat, the 15th day of the month of Shabbat. That is, that is when it actually is. So the opinion of the, of the house of Shammai is not followed in practice. Now, it's very beautiful to know the minority opinion is always recorded, always respected and, and recorded. Not only that, the Talmud says that the reason we always follow the house of Hillel is because they always quoted the opinion of the other side first and always, always gave polite deference to it. And, and so it also says that they were um, pleasant in their demeanor and welcoming to everyone they encountered. So because of that, we follow their opinion in matters of law, which actually is, is kind of awesome if you think about it. You might think the law is like, well, it depends who's right, right? It depends who can like marshal the best arguments and produce the best evidence. But actually, they were nicer and they listened best to the other side. And so we follow their opinion. That was a good lesson for us also. So we have the first of Shabbat, which is literally today and or tonight soon for some of you. And then we have the 15th of the month, which is to Shabbat, this new year for trees. The new year for trees, I should say, similar to the animals, it was originally just a tax day. It was originally for the purpose of deciding, since the Torah tells us to bring fruit from a tree to the temple, how do you decide when you have to bring it exactly is according to, is the tree one year old, three years old, four years old? You need to know when you count that. And they don't expect people to count from like the exact moment the tree was planted or whatever. You might not even know that. So there's a certain date. If, if the tree has passed this point, then it's a year old and so on. So that's, that's the idea. And Rashi, our great French medieval commentator, explains, talking about the piece of Talmud where this Mishnah is uh, elaborated on a little bit, he explains it beautifully for us. He says, this point, he's actually talking about the first of Shabbat, uh, but you know, equally applies to the, the point two weeks later. Since most of the days of rain, i.e. winter, have already passed, it is the beginning of the time of the production of fruit and the sap begins to rise in the trees, and the fruit begins to ripen from this point. Now, I am not a botanist, and I do not know if this is technically correct, but I love the idea behind it, which is actually saying there are different stages in the growth of things. There's a stage when you're waiting for the rain to come down, and then there's a stage where that has finished, where you know, you're done waiting for the rain, and you turn your attention to what's going on inside, what's going to happen with that rain, right? You're turning your attention to the sap rising within. So that's the very important theme for us of Tu Bishvat, the sap rising within the trees. And as we're going to see, we are uh, analog to the trees. The Torah says, uh, the Torah actually asked a question. The Torah says in uh, De Deuteronomy 2019, it says, um, is a tree like a person? It's a rhetorical question. The answer is obviously no, in the context the Torah is asking question. But the rabbis take that quote from the Torah and they take advantage of the fact that Hebrew doesn't actually have so many things that English do have that make it clear that it's a rhetorical question and they turn the question into a statement. So the rabbis turn, is a tree like a person into a statement, which is a person is like a tree. And there are many, many, many teachings on, the, on that in the Midrash, on the later commentaries, how a person is like a tree, all the different ways we are like trees. So if we are like trees and the trees are having a new year and the whole point of the new year, the trees, according to Rashi is, the sap of new life is beginning to rise within us to create new fruit. And we have an amazing opportunity this month to think about what is the fruit I want to create? What is the sap that is rising within me? How can I encourage that sap to rise within me in the way I want to, to produce the fruit that I want for this new month? So that's some of the direction we're going in. I'll just pause there, stop the share and just uh, come back to you for uh, any reflections or questions from anyone would like to ask anything about any of that or chime in on any of that? Totally fine. We'll keep checking in and feel free to, to chime in on the chat whenever you like. I'll just point out that the root of the word uh, for sap is uh, it's saraf. So in the Hebrew, I'm uh, highlighting now on my screen. So it's sin, resh, final fay. For those of you who know the Hebrew letters, this word here has saraf. The hey is just the. And uh, that word also means 
uh, fire, actually, three families of fire. So there's something beautiful about the sap. It's like this fiery juice of new life. It's this fiery quality within us. And it's really interesting. The sap is caused by the rain, which, you know, water is obviously the opposite element to fire. The rain going down to the ground, which is another element, the earth, right, causes the fire to rise up inside the trees to let the new cycle of life begin. It's just an interesting relationship between the different elements of life. So let me uh, keep moving. And as I said, please feel free to jump in at any point uh, on the chat at least, and, and I'll check it back in with you soon. There's a be beautiful Hasidic teaching here about when Tu Bishva is and what it means in the overall cycle of the calendar. And to appreciate it, we need to know a couple of things. We need to know that the Talmud says, and this is uh, the first thing he quotes here, the top of the teaching in teaching number three from the Bnei Yisachar. The first thing he says is, uh, quoting from the Talmud in Sota, a section of the Talmud, 2a, he says, 40 days before an embryo is formed, a divine voice announces in the heavens, the daughter of so-and-so is destined to marry so-and-so. And the quote from the Talmud continues to say, um, 40 days before a person is conceived, um, a divine voice calls out in the heavens. Also, um, what piece of land a person will be attached to and what house they will live in and so on. So there's this idea that even before a, a set of parents, you know, come together to, con to conceive, to, to make a person, even before that happens, even before that process begins, the parents may not even know each other yet, who knows, right? Even before that happens, the divine creator is paying attention, is investing energy and intention and love in us and is saying, oh, like this person, this is going to be like, you know, part of their life destiny, part of their story. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm looking and I'm, I'm checking, I'm caring, where does this person belong and who do they belong with, even before that person uh, is even conceived. And when we, it's interesting, this is one of the sources for a concept that some of us may have heard of, of a bishet, the idea that, you know, every person has like another person who's intended for them, a soulmate interesting idea we find sometimes not something you know i i uh, not something i go around saying you know is necessarily definitely true for everyone but nonetheless it's an idea the uh, the tradition reflects so let's work our way through the rest of this teaching and then we'll come back together i'd love to hear your input on this so he says 40 days before the 25th of elul is the time before us of tuba at this time israel arise and thought to be wedded to the most honored sovereign so i have to explain this and why we're talking about it now and then we'll, then we'll bring it back to our month. So we saw in the Mishnah that there's a few new years. The two main new years are Rosh Hashanah, the first of Tishrei, that's the Jewish new year, right? And then the first of Nisan, the new year of spring, the new year just before Pesach. Those are the two big ones. And actually, there's an argument in the Talmud which, as to which of them is primary. So we take it for granted now when we say Happy New Year, Jews really only say that really for real, in, on Rosh Hashanah and Tishrei in the autumn and the fall in the Northern Hemisphere, right? But that's, that's not necessarily always the case. In the Talmud, there are serious arguments and serious opinions saying that the spring new year might actually be the primary one. There's, there's an opinion that that might be when the world was actually created and so on. So it comes out that after a huge amount of rabbinic debate, uh, that there's a very nice kind of compromise reach between the spring and the autumn, which is that the world was conceived in the autumn, conceived in both senses, right? In thought and also in terms of procreation. And then it was actually birthed in manifestation in the spring. And this works really beautifully in terms of what's going on at that time. You know, in spring, in the Northern Hemisphere again, sorry, in the fall, let's do fall first. In the fall in the Northern Hemisphere, you know, things are turning inward. It's getting darker. It's getting colder. The cycle of life is clearly closing in. We, we've harvested what, everything that we've already grown, right? And we're accounting for it and so on. So we're turning in for winter. And then in the spring, obviously, things are ready to burst out again and to flourish again. So that's, that's the, uh, the understanding of those two new years. And 40 days before the, now I should explain why it says the 25th of Elul. 25th of Elul is six days before Rosh Hashanah, the first of Tishrei. Who cares what that is? Why? Why six days before? But here's how the rabbis figure it out. They say the first of Tishrei, is we, we say Happy New Year. We say that's the day of the creation of the world, or as I just said, really the conception of the world. We say in Rosh Hashanah, Hayom Harat Olam, today is the day the world was conceived. But what the rabbis say is actually, technically, 
it's not the day the world was conceived, it's the day that humanity was conceived. What they say is Rosh Hashanah, that sixth day, uh, sorry, that first day of Tishrei, first day of Tishrei, is equivalent to the sixth day of creation. According to the biblical narrative, and we don't have to take it literally, but still the idea is there, that there are six days of creation, and on the sixth day, humanity is created, Adam is created, the first person, and then there's Shabbat, the seventh day, the day of rest. So if Rosh Hashanah, I'll just say all that again, if Rosh Hashanah is day six, then the 25th of Elul is six days before that, which makes it day one. So the 25th of Elul is day one of creation for the full creation, the creation of actually conception of turning inward and so on. So why, why is this important? Why, why is this important? Because he says 40 days before that, there's a little mini festival on the full moon of Av, which is not so well known, called Tuba Av. If you'd like to find out more about it, my Jewish learning have great articles about it, I'm sure. Please look them up after the class. It's a very interesting festival. Tuba Av is a, essentially a love festival. It's a day of unity and love and coming together. And that is 40 days before, as I said, that process of creation starts in the autumn. And now he says something very interesting. In the final paragraph, he says, so it is with Tu Bishvat, which is celebrated as a festival. It is a new year for the trees. And notice how it is also 40 days before the 25th of Adar, as hinted by the verse, for a person is a tree of the field. What's 25th of Adar? That is six days before the first of Nisan. So if the 25th of Elul is the beginning of creation in the fall, in the autumn, then the 25th of Adar is the beginning of creation in the spring. And, the, and that's remember, that is creation of actual manifestation, of actual birth, right? And creation in the fall is just conception of thinking about it and conceiving a beginning creation. But spring is when things actually burst into manifestation. And six days before that, is the, the beginning of that process, the first day of that creation is the 25th of Adar. And this is, this is the idea we're building towards. 40 days before that, we have the new year for the trees. Well, all of that was so we get to this point and begin to understand that together. What does it mean that 40 days before creation, we have the new year for the trees? And, he, and we're going to put that together with the teaching from the tower that he brought, that he quoted from Sota at the beginning of his teaching. 40 days before an embryo is formed, the divine voice announces the daughter of so-and-so is destined to marry so-and-so. So the way this is interpreted by some Kabbalists is that 40 days before anything is created, there's an investment of divine love. There's, there's the divine is saying, I want you to exist and I care about you and I love you and I, I'm checking to make sure you're okay. I'm, I'm making sure that your destiny is going to work out well. So Tu Bishvat, the new year for the trees, when we honor the living world around us, is, according to this teaching, a time when that is happening, not only from us, like not only are we paying attention to the trees and honoring them, but also even the divine, and maybe also the divine through us is doing that, is saying creation is coming. Creation is coming in 40 days' time, and the divine, again, maybe through us, is checking to see that the destiny of creation is going to be okay, is investing care and love and attention to make sure the world is going to be okay. All right, I know that was a lot. It was a teaching I, uh, I had my doubts about including because it required so much explanation. So I'm going to come back together with you now and just see if there's any clarifying questions or anyone want to share anything on that, reflections or anything you'd like to. Yeah, there were a couple of questions in the chat. Um, oh, great. Someone asked, if there was a relationship between any of this and the tree of life. Oh, yes. Great. Hmm. It all starts with the tree, doesn't it? Yeah, it all starts with two trees. With, oh, the two trees in the Garden of Eden, which some commentators actually say is the same tree, um, which is a difficult teaching for me to understand, but it's, it's there. Um, the Kabbalists take the model of the tree very seriously. They, they say that, I mean, first of all, you know, we call the Torah the tree of life, right? So that's, that's already a pretty big deal. But then the Kabbalists say that actually a tree is a way of understanding all of existence, that all, all the whole universe can be best understood as a tree, and that we human beings are a microcosm of the universe. And so a great way to understand us is as a tree. So for example, they say we are an upside down tree in that our roots are actually 
in the spiritual world where our real nourishment comes from. So a tree needs its roots in the soil that, that otherwise, you know, it's not getting any nourishment, it can't survive. But we get our nourishment from up above and then, uh, and then our branches and leaves and our fruit is what happens down here on earth, is, is our speech and our actions and so on. And so too with the whole universe, the Kabbalists see it as this upside down tree getting its nourishment from up above. And that, that's the real tree of life and everything else is a microcosm of that. So when we, when we celebrate the new year for trees here on our planet, you know, in our world, then we're, we're really celebrating all of life in a very deep way. Um, this thing, what is the spiritual significance of the number 40? It seems many times in the Torah, 40 of the one ring, 40 days of flood and so on. Yeah, that is a very big subject. It's used for a lot of things. Um, it is the number associated with the letter Mem, which is one of the the mother letters the most important elemental letters right in the middle of the alphabet of the hebrew alphabet um there's aleph at the beginning and mem in the middle that and then tough at the end um to get, which together make the word truth i met um mem yeah it's very important in denoting water uh and in denoting um completion of things calm of things um and it seems to be, uh, well, I'm also thinking about it a lot of times in the Bible, it says, you know, when, when the Bible wants to say, the Torah wants to say, or later books of the Tanakh, um, they want to say like, there was peace, you know, for a good long period. It always seems to be like, there was peace for 40 years. Um, so it se seems to be, um, you know, very, uh, very important way of, way of saying, you know, a good amount. And, the, the word the word for four and therefore also for 40 in Hebrew, Arba and Abayim, are very similar sounding to the word for many. So there are some people who, who speculate that, you know, there's a connection there between just, if you want to say lots, then four or 40 is just, a, you know, it, it's a very close way of saying it. Um, but there's, there's all these deeper meanings to it. He's, uh, Ellen just posted Mem symbolizes transformation. That is really interesting. Um, Ellen, if you want to add anything else about that, you're, you're very welcome to. I, I'm, uh, I'd love to hear more about that. Uh, Moses lived for 120 years, which is said three times 40. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. There's actually, um, there are a few really good, beautiful books on the Hebrew letters uh, you can find on you know, all, all places where you find books, uh, which give you pages of like references and associations for, for all these letters. Moses went up for 40 days and 40 nights. Indeed. Right. Exactly. Um, the flowers. Well. Sorry, sorry Judy, someone on. also had asked about the word Shvat, the, of yeah. the month. If you could comment on the name of the month. Yeah. You know, I don't think I know anything about it at all, actually, except that most of the names of the months I know were actually named, they were named in Babylon uh, after what was going on in ancient Babylon when the exiles were there. I suspect this is the same because I don't think it's it's a word. You know, the word we use when we say in Hebrew Shabbat for the day of rest, um, it's the same two first letters, but then the last letter is different. Instead of the tet, it's a tough. Uh, so it's not that, but it's you know it's similar sounding. Um, but yeah, it's not a word I see any anything else similar to in Hebrew. So I wonder if it, it, it came from ancient Babylon. Um, yeah, that, that's a good question. The Wikipedia page for the month will probably tell us, actually. Um, but I'm going to carry on with the class. Um, and please feel free to, to join me. And also feel free to jump in with more uh, questions and comments as we go. So we're going to look at the theme of eating, as I mentioned, is key this month. And we're going to go from the beginning of that story and then look at some great teachings about it. We'll start, as we often do, with Sefer Yitzhira, our oldest work of Jewish mysticism that we have. And it tells us a few things about every month. It tells us um, the letter for our month is a tzadi. And that taste, um, really the Hebrew word lita can be taste or uh, putting food in one's mouth or swallowing. And it really can be, can be, it's used for all different aspects of eating. Um, and it also tells us the uh, constellation for the month is Aquarius, the bucket, the water bearer. And finally, the part of the body for a month is the corkaban, it calls, which the Zohar explains is the stomach. So obviously also related to eating. So these are the characteristics of our month. Safi Yatsira gives us different characteristics for every month. So every month has you know, a letter and a, and a thing that people do and a constellation and a part of the body. And those are the ones for our, our month. 
or we're going to focus just on the eating part. The constellation part is a, is a whole fascinating thing uh, to itself. There's more to that, but we, you know, we don't have time to go into everything in depth. So we're just going to look at some really important sources connecting eating to Tubishvat, first of all, and then we'll think about eating in general. So first, something from Rav Sadov, the great Hasidic master, end of the uh, 19th century in Poland. So he said, quoting Seyf Yitzirah, he made the letter Sadiq over taste, king over taste, for the root of the snake's seduction of Eve was with eating. And through fixing the deficiency in eating, everything is fixed. So here he just makes a very good, quick, short point for us. It all went wrong. And somebody mentioned the tree of life before in the Garden of Eden. It all went wrong with eating, right? Eat it. We think we have lots of different theories about the Garden of Eden. You know, Adam and Eve, they didn't take responsibility for what they did. And, you know, they, they tried to, uh, you know, cover it up. Yeah, true. And, you know, they tried to blame each other. True, it wasn't great. But the actual essence of what they actually, actually did that they weren't supposed to do was eat the thing they weren't supposed to eat, right? Eat from the tree, the tree, by the way, eat from the tree, which was forbidden. So eating in tree is pretty central to the whole story there, right? And he says, if, if everything was broken with eating, then obviously everything is going to be fixed with eating, right? Obviously, that's, that's like a, a natural conclusion for a Kabbalist to draw. Like, you know, the same way that you break something ultimately is going to be like through that process that you fix it. So let's look at some sources about eating and see what the tradition has to say about it. I'm going to start with the Torah, with Deuteronomy, the source number six. And I, I wrote in the blog for the source, uh, you know, the intro for it, that Judaism totally revolves around food. You know, may, maybe by now you've realized that and embraced that, and maybe you haven't. But it, whether you look at the Torah or rabbinic Judaism, it's just absolutely central. Just a vast amount of it is about like how you grow the food and distribute it and offerings, which of course are food. And you know, we, as we're going to see um, in this class, offerings are actually talked about as being food for God, right? So it's, it's, Food, food, food. You know, it's a kind of funny, true stereotype that we're obsessed with that. And it's central to our civilization. Of course, Yom Kippur, one of our most famous days, is famous for the fact that like, that's one day in the whole year that we're asked to abstain from food. You know, that's the, the, the most famous ma major fast day. You know, that's the one most Jews will know about or maybe keep. So that, that's, uh, those are the markers. You know, and of course, if you think about the things that, you know, most Jews do engage in, like Seder night on Passover and so on, of course, they revolve around food as well. So the Torah says, and you will eat, be a chalta, and be sated, the savata, and you shall bless the eternal your God for the good land he has given you. So lovely verse from the Torah, be a chalta, the savata, um, you will eat and be satisfied and be blessed. And this is the root of the commandment, the obligation that after we eat a significant amount of food, you know, uh, in more than, more than just a mouthful, then we should bless, we should say thanks. And, you know, this is even uh, quoted in the traditional grace after meals, the traditional Becha Tamazon, if you're familiar. So, interesting, the Midrash says about this, that it's natural that when our stomach is full and we're satisfied, that actually we wouldn't thank. And, and therefore, we need to be obligated to thank them. <clears throat> because we might be in a state of being satisfied and think, well, I've got what I need. And... You know, why should I bother expressing gratitude? In other words, we don't, when, we're, when our stomach is full, we don't feel our, our dependency on the world, on life, on the creator of life so acutely, right? We, we have what we need, right? When we feel full and we feel satisfied, we don't feel vulnerable. We don't, we don't feel needy in the same way. So therefore, we're obligated. The Torah says, remember, even when your stomach is full and you're satisfied and you've already got what you need for now, remember, to give thanks. That's an important practice. So even just right there, that's a very important part of our relationship with food, to give thanks and be, be mindful how lucky we are to have the food we have, even though we might not actually feel the need to do that uh, in terms of the chemicals running around our body at the time. Right? We, we, we might just feel like, oh, you know, great, I have everything I need done. But actually, no. We, there's there's an obligation Judaism places on us to think about, wow, I'm so lucky that I have what I've just consumed. And, and to remember that, you know, in a few hours time or a few days time, or whatever, we're going to need it again. And we can't take it for granted. So let's look at a couple of other things about food and then uh, we'll come back together. And I'd love to hear your questions and comments. Number seven from the Talmud in Brachot. Rabbi Yochanan and Rabbi Elazar both say, as long as the temple stood, 
the altar atoned for Israel's transgressions. Now that it is destroyed, a person's table atones for their transgression. I really like this one. Now, for first glance, didn't get it so much. The more I thought about it, you know, I grew up, and I think it's less and less common today for many of us, but you know, I grew up in a home where I think things were not ideal in every way, but there was a family dinner time, right? There was a time when people sat around and you knew you could have a conversation with other people in the family over food, of course. And it was over food, therefore, that relationships were built and progressed and repaired. And what else is that? What else is the altar and the temple for except that, right? That is, as he says, atoning for our transgressions. You make a mistake you go to the temple to fix it. Now that we don't have that anymore, you make a mistake, you sit around your table, right? Whether you're, I mean, even if this even applies, even if you're on your own, really, I think, you know, kitchen table time, as one of my friends calls, I think it's a very important thing. But, uh, but, you know, also with other people, like you sit around, you break bread, right? You share the space and the experience of maybe preparing, but certainly consuming together. And relationships, as we know, I think, as we've experienced, develop very, very importantly in that context. In fact, it's pretty hard to imagine many of our key relationships without that context, right? That's very, very formative for many of us. And let me uh, come back to you all and just see if anyone has any input on any of those sources. Uh, let's see. Oh, wow, see, there's loads on the chat. Okay. Um, Wikipedia says uh, Shabbat is from Akkadian, brilliant and means strike, that refers to the heavy rains of the season. Brilliant, thank you for that, Elaine. Uh, Steve, what type of tree or wood did Moses use to sweeten the water? Ooh, what was that? Oh, I don't remember, I'm sorry, Steve. I did some uh, reconnaissance on this question. Um, and so there are, there's a debate, I just looked this up, um, and some people think it was a sweet tree to oh, make no, sweeter, it was a so date. Yeah. Right, you remember now, it's ringing a bell, date or pomegranate, and some other opinions think it was actually something bitter. Right. Yeah, I think the bitter people win. I think, I think uh, if I remember rightly, it's like that, yeah, they had to, they had to uh, put a bitter tree in to sweeten the water, yeah. Um, thank you for that, Steve, reminding us of that story about trees, very beautiful. Actually related, loosely related to that, but that story just reminded me of like other things in the Torah that happened related to what we're talking about. The first day of the month of Shabbat, which again is right now for me and those of you who it's nighttime for and will with you soon, is actually the day that the book of Deuteronomy begins. It says that Moses stands up in front of the people and the book of Deuteronomy, Devarim, you may know, is Moses' good, goodbye speech. So Moses stands up to say, it's been nice. And uh, he actually, he starts, up on a, starts off on a not so positive note, but it gets better and better as he goes. And that uh, is seen as the beginning of the oral Torah, the beginning of the Torah that we make and contribute to. So that, that actually begins today. So it's, it's a good day for learning Torah and a good day also to think about that new sap of creativity flowing. Um, just looking else at the chat, Elaine says, conversely, gorging on food is not considered eating. Too much food is disgusting to be avoided. Beautiful. Yeah, thank you for mentioning that, Elaine. Yeah, there's this concept in the Talmud. It's called Achila uh, Gasa. It's like gross overeating, like disgusting overeating, I was going. And as Elaine correctly said, you don't even bless on that. And it's not even considered eating. In fact, uh, you know, technically, you could even do it on a fast day. There's a very interesting concept that rabbis have. So to really eat uh, involves some kind of mindfulness and awareness and, and not doing that. Beautiful. Okay, well, let us keep going on the sheet and please, please keep jumping in. This is great stuff. Okay, number eight. Uh, this is lovely. This is a really uh, beautiful source for mindfulness of eating. So I often used it in, uh, in mindfulness context uh, to talk about being mindful when we eat. So this is, this is one way we can understand what it means to eat mindfully, to eat consciously. Uh, from a beautiful work called Chovot Halavavot, The Duties of the Heart. Whoever contemplates the natural processes of the body, how when food enters, it is distributed to every part of the body, will see such signs of wisdom that he will be inspired to thank the creator and to praise him. As David said, all of my bones shall say, God, who is like you? Carrying on over the page. They will see how food passes into the stomach through a straight tube called the esophagus, excuse me, without any bend or twist, 
how afterwards the stomach digests the food more thoroughly than the chewing has, how then the food is carried into the liver through thin connecting veins that act as a strainer, preventing anything coarse from passing into the, through to the liver, how the liver converts the food it receives into blood, which is distributed all over the body through tubes that look like water pipes and were formed specifically for this purpose. So, you know, in other words, just look at our bodies, you know, and we know even more, so much more than he did, I mean, he and in his time. I don't know if he himself was a doctor, he may well have been. Many, many, many great rabbis and sages down through the ages were also physicians, um, just because that was part of the body of knowledge that was, you know, wise people who were, who were studious in many things, that was part of what they learned. But we know even more, you know, we can go on the internet and in 10 seconds access amazing videos and other resources for seeing what's going on inside our body about how miraculous it is. Just think about it, just being aware of that, you know, and even if we are not, uh, you know, actively believing in the hand of the creator, even, even, even if we're devout atheists and we think this all just happened, fine, great, but it's still, I still stand by the word miraculous in the sense of, is still so incredibly beautiful the way that it developed the way it did and the way it all interacts it's just remarkable to appreciate the intricacy of the details and as we know and as we say in one of our blessings if one thing would open that's supposed to be closed or if one thing would close that's supposed to be open we know the rest of the sentence right we don't even need to say it. like you know it wouldn't it wouldn't wouldn't be wouldn't be wouldn't be here right so that's that's going on all the time all the time in all of us and that's happening you know in a million different ways in all of us all the time so just just an incredible thing to reflect on so that's one way we could be mindful of eating is to think about wow like what's going on in my body right now and when i'm eating or drinking what's going on with that you know what does it mean that this thing from outside my body is going to join my body somehow it's going to become part of me or at least part part of it will become part of me and obviously part of it may be uh evacuated as waste. Let me just come back to you and see if anyone has any input about that. Not yet, that's fine. Okay, keep jumping in if you do. Oh, I see a hand, great. Uh, Diana, feel free to chat or say what you would like to say. Okay, I'll, I'll try and unmute you. You should be able to unmute now, Diana. Well, Diana is hopefully unmuting. I'll just read what Rachel wrote on the chat. This became so meaningful to me when I had a kidney removed. A prayer on my wall reminds me of how grateful we must be for digestive functions. Beautiful, Rachel. Yeah, that's, that's a really uh, lovely way to do it, right? To remind ourselves of this in some way, like putting something in our, our field of vision. That's, that's really powerful. Beautiful. Um, okay, I, I guess, Diana, please just jump in when, when you would like to. I guess for now, we're going to move on. So we saw a little bit about, you know, being mindful in the way, in the kind of more physical sense. Now we're going to see how the Kabbalists, the mystics, approach that question, like what it means to eat consciously for a mystic in Judaism. And we'll begin actually with a work of law, but actually a work of law, the Shulchan Aruch, the Code of Jewish Law, was actually written by a mystic. Rav Yosef Cairo was a legalist, but also a Kabbalist, also a mystic. So he says, anything that is pleasant for him in this world his, sorry, his here is the, uh, the anonymous third person uh, Jewish protagonist. So anything that, any, we can also read it, uh, you know, ungendered language. Anything that is pleasant for us in this world, our intent should not be for our pleasure, but rather for the service of their creator. May, they, may he be blessed. As it is written, in all your ways, acknowledge him, Proverbs. And the sages said, let all of your actions be for the sake of heaven as even optional things, such as eating, drinking, walking, sitting, getting up, sexual relations and conversation, all of them should be for the service of your creator or for something that enables serving him. And when it says optional things, it means you know, things we're not explicitly commanded to do, right? The Torah never says you must eat, right? There we saw that verse that says, you know, when you eat and you're satisfied, then bless. But obviously, we, as we know, we need to eat. That's going to happen. So, but it's not considered something we're commanded to do. But even things like that, it's saying that we're not commanded to do should nonetheless be for the service of the creator. The avodat orecha, right? They, it's still actually we're serving the divine according to this worldview all the time. 
according to everything we do. And that's so what that's what it means to be a mystic, to be constantly yearning for and working towards divine union. And actually, really, Judaism places the bar pretty high for all of us. Like in a lot of ways, Judaism builds the system with the goal, with the intention that we're all actually working towards that. That we're all actually working towards being conscious of the oneness of the divine, whatever we want to call it, the in soft, the infinite one ultimately all the time. Of course, you know, none of us are going to achieve that right away, but that, that is actually the goal that we're, that we're, we're understanding, we're relating and feeling ultimately how everything we're doing throughout our lives actually is in relationship with God. And that is the posture of the Kabbalists. And then as we're going to see soon, the Hasidic movement of the Baal Shem Tov brought that into a more accessible frame for the masses. So first of all, let's see this very brief line from the Zohar says when uh, the context here is the Zohar is talking about sacrifices. It's talking about when our ancestors brought sacrifices to the temple and it says, Israel sustain their father in heaven. And even before the Zohar, there were, there was Midrash that said very similar things, just not quite as strongly. So the idea here is, and actually I should say, even the Torah itself, actually God says in the Torah, God speaks and says, sacrifices are my bread are my food. So even, you know, it goes, it goes back a long way, this idea. So God needs food of some kind, according to the Torah. And when we bring sacrifices, that's somehow feeding the divine. At the same time, the divine is perfect. The divine is infinite. The divine existed forever, is eternal. The divine doesn't really need anything, right? So there, there's this, this paradox that we hold in the, in the mystic tradition between these things. That God, God is completely perfect, but the way the mystics understand it is, God makes God's self less perfect in order to be in relationship with us. So actually, we're not going to have time to do the whole, looking over the page, I kind of uh, outlined that story. You won't have time to do this slowly. I'm going to kind of summarize it quickly. This is like the history of the universe according to Kabbalah, so that we can then understand a couple of sources based on that. And actually, it begins with what I just mentioned. The divine, is, the divine, the ends of the infinite one is completely perfect and infinite and wants to share and wants to give and wants to love. The only way that something that is infinite and eternal and perfect can love is called simsum. That is, as it says there, number two, divine contraction. God has to make God's self smaller to make room for us, to make room for anything else, right? If, if, if God didn't do that, there would just be infinite light and no space for free will, no space for evil, no space for anything else except that divine light. So, then the next few stages are what I'm going to summarize briefly. Basically, God pours love and light and goodness into the world, into what, what, has, what has now been uh, made into an empty space and will be the world. And there's a problem, which is the vessels which are there don't know how to share with each other or don't want to share, so they break. So then what you get is a universe that is full of little bits of God's love and light, which has been born in the world, little sparks of that, which are covered up by the broken shards of the vessels, which are now covering them up. So you've got a whole world of love and light, but the love and light is actually covered and the light is actually scattered. So that's the world we live in according to the Kabbalists and tikkun olam, fixing the world according to Kabbalah, means finding those sparks and raising them up to their original source, saying, oh God, here is a piece of spark of divine light and I'm giving it back to you. I'm, I'm reunifying it with you. I'm, and I'm, in doing so, I'm fixing God. This is what the mystic think we're doing all the time. We're fixing God, which is also fixing the universe, fixing ourselves, fixing the world. Tikkun Olam, as I said, fixing the world. So that's, that's the worldview of the Jewish mystics. You know, give or take a few details. Um, in short, that our job is to find these sparks of the divine and everything and raise them up. And now we're going to see how that's really brought into our daily life by the Hasidic text, right? The Baal Shem Tov founded the Hasidic movement. He revealed himself around 1740 and started offering these teachings. And he did not expect it, but really it happened a generation after he passed away in the, in the generation of his students and their students. His teachings inspired a massive movement that transformed the lives of millions of people and totally redrew the map of Judaism, certainly in Eastern and also I think Central Europe, and even I think to this day, very, very influential. So he says in this teaching here at number 11, Keter Shem Tov, every act of eating and drinking that a person does is literally a portion of their sparks, which they need to repair. 
This is a classic example of what Hasidu, the Hasidic teachings does, right? It takes the Kabbalistic idea I said before that the world is full of divine sparks that we need to find and brings it really right down to each individual and with, with the real emphasis on the individu individuality of each person. Because what he's saying is there are divine sparks that only you can find, right? There are divine sparks specific to each person and in each situation meaning you know there's a divine spark that you can pick up right now that you may never have the opportunity that nobody will have the opportunity to do again that, that only right now can you do that and that that all of creation in a certain way no pressure depends on you doing that and you you have a unique gift that you can give to creation right now through doing that let's see one more thing from about and then i'll come back to you and hear any input you have on this he says a person should always see which quality is arriving, arising in their thoughts, whether it is from love or awe or harmony. So those are uh, the uh, names of the sifirot, the qualities in, the, in what we call the tree of life. The tree of life is, uh, you know, what, as I mentioned before, one way the Kabbalists see the whole universe and one way they, see, one way they understand it is a tree a diagram that you may have seen of different qualities, sifirot, emanations, uh, which are God's personality traits is one way of understanding them another way of understanding them is it's the the vessels the doorways through which the divine shines into the world so love and awe and harmony are, are names for the first three of the lower ones of those um so we should see which quality is arising in our thoughts like do am i feeling love which would also include things like desire like you know do i did i do i love this food do i desire this food that would include that or awe, fear anxiety and so on or harmony and elevate that quality uh, uh, he'll explain what that means a little bit even though it is a worldly concern bound up in physical desires they can elevate it so even if i'm thinking oh i really want that item of food or that other thing i really want i can elevate it and he'll say now, so while eating or drinking, when love arises, then take the pleasure which derives from this act of eating and drinking and elevate that pleasure to the blessed creator. So he's saying the pleasure we can have from food and anything else for that matter, we can actually use that as an opening and invitation to experience pleasure and desire and love for God, which for a mystic is you know, the ultimate thing to do that for. So we can use any emotion, anything we experience inside as an invitation to experience that directed towards God. So we can work with our emotions and we can say, oh, like, what would it mean to, to turn that towards something else? And, you know, if you're not a Kabbalist and the example of God doesn't resonate with you so much in just a very down to earth way, I can work with my emotions and my desires to say, OK, I really, really want that thing which I know actually is not so good for me. It could be food or it could be anything else, right? I'm addicted to such and such a thing. What would, it, what would it look like to work with my desire to do that thing and actually to redirect it to something which is good for me, right? So yeah, if someone's trying to give up smoking cigarettes, for an example, right? It's not actually that easy if you just take away the cigarettes without putting something else in its place, hopefully something better, right? Something, something nourishing. So we can redirect the need and the desire to something that actually serves us. Let's come back together and uh, then we'll see a little bit more together after I've seen your, uh, your input. Um, Elaine says, interesting thought from the Talmud, Sanhedrin, great is eating for it distances those who are near and brings close those who are far. Interesting, yeah, I haven't heard that teaching. Elaine, if you have a page number of the Talmud to share on that, that I would love to see that. Fascinating. Elizabeth says, can you speak to each month being attributed to one of the sons of Yaakov? Uh, yes. Good question, Elizabeth. So there are a few different ways that uh, this is uh, allocated, but the, the Midrash does this. It says, you know, there are 12 months and there are 12 sons of Jacob or you know, we always count them as 12, even though it's, uh, it's, it's tricky, but that's how we do it. Oh, thank you, Elaine, for the page number. I'll check that out. Um, and so uh, the, it's actually the, the tribes of, of uh, the tribes of Jacob, because Joseph is, Joseph's two sons get, uh, each get a, a month, if I remember rightly. So uh, then the character traits of each of those tribes are connected by the Midrash 
with with each month. And actually, if anyone is uh, is interested in learning a bit more about that, that is one of the things mentioned in this lovely book, which I may, I may have shown some of you before, uh, Kabbalah Month by Month by Mindy or Melinda Ribner. It's really a lovely guide to a lot of these things. Kat Carolyn is waving her too, beautiful. Um, so she she has like a little passage on a lot of these things, you know, the constellation of the month and, uh, and the, this too. And she suggests like meditations and things to work with too. Um, yeah, I, I, it's not something I've, uh, I've gone deeply into myself. So I don't, I don't think I have much to say about it uh, right now, except, you know, some of them, for some of the months, I, I've learned some of the correspondences for our month. Um, I can't say I have much to, to share out there right now. Um, shall we do a little bit more? We have just a few more minutes. Let, let's do a tiny bit more together. And then, we'll, then we'll come back together to end. So Degel Machan Ephraim, source number 13. This is the grandson of the Baal Shem Tov, who grew up literally on his knee. Um, he says in number 13, a wholesome person can unify the Blessed Holy One with their every step and with everything they do, including in material matters, their eating, work, and business affairs. So again, just bringing that Kabbalistic idea right back down to earth for us. If we are you know, working on being more shalem, as the Hebrew is, Adam shalem, more, more integrated, more complete, more wholesome, then ultimately we're doing this work of fixing the world and fixing the divine and, and unifying the divine in everything we do. So it, sometimes we use in Judaism this language of unifying the divine. It sounds very lofty and spiritual and we, you know, we might well think that has nothing to do with me. Actually, it has everything to do with us if you eat or you work or you just walk around this world, right? Every step you take, every, everything you do is actually potentially unifying the divine. So it's not actually some out there lofty spiritual thing. It's really, you know, very, very grounded and physical. It's just a matter of how we do it, a matter of kavana, of intention. And finally, we're going to bring this back down to Tubishva. So back to Rav Sadok, we saw before the Rich Hasidic master from Poland. He says in the pre Sadik, the traditional practice of Israel is Torah, i.e., it's very holy, it has a lot of sanctity. For if they are not prophets, they are the children of prophets. So, what does that mean? What it means is, even if something isn't told to us to do in the Torah, if the Jewish people do it, it becomes Torah, as it were, right? That, that our, our minhag, our custom, our practice, actually takes on a sanctity of its own. And he's talking here about the Tubishvat Seder, which you may or may not be aware of. Again, my Jewish learning has great articles about it, I'm sure. The Tubishvat Seder was started by the Kabbalists of Svat, actually the student of the Arizal, Rabbi Isaac Luria, who um, the, his, he was the one who I used for the guide to the universe on the previous sheet. So his students took his teachings and said that the new year for trees, that, which is exactly the 15th of... Uh, of Shvat, of our month, is exactly two months before Seder night, the, 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 the night where we have a Seder for Passover to mark the exodus from Egypt at the beginning of Pesach. And, he's, and they said, right, we are going to prepare for Passover by having a Seder in which we eat all different kinds of fruit. And that's what Rav Salak is talking about here, that this is what we do. And when we eat all these different kinds of fruit, traditionally, we especially eat fruit connected to the land of Israel because that has special sanctity. As he says here, all eating will be fixed and sanctified. So we learned before about eating mindfully, eating consciously, eating spiritually. So this ritual specifically in our month, in the middle of our month, on the full moon of our month, is especially uh, ripe. <laughs> no pun, sorry. That wasn't intended, but that's what I said. Especially ripe for this spiritual work of fixing eating. And as he goes on to say, so they will be redeemed from every single thing in Nissan. And of course, one of the, really, if we think about like the main act of Pesach, of Passover, that, you know, it's very, very central to the Seder ritual and really uh, sums up the whole festival. It's eating the matzah, the special flat bread that we, that we eat on that festival. And it's so much more powerful and meaningful to eat matzah if we can eat it with a little bit, hopefully, a little, maybe even more than a little bit, of consciousness, of mindfulness, of awareness of what we're doing. So it actually makes a lot of sense at this point Two months before, we are taking the opportunity to say, okay, what's my relationship to food? How do I eat? And can I begin investing in that now so that then I can experience eating the matzah and the liberation from Pesach more freely? And of course, that ties back in with what we learned before. If the original sin, the original 
breaking was through eating, then we have a lot of work to do to fix through eating. So uh, the last source is actually not for us to read together. It's a prayer for the Tu Bishvat Seder uh, that is just for you to enjoy in your own time if you would like to. I just like to say a couple more words about mindful eating and then hear any last thoughts from any of you. It doesn't have to be that you eat super slowly for a whole meal or a whole snack. Um, basically, eating slowly is the key to mindful eating, but you can even just try to do it just for the first bite. You can, I promise you it will completely change the experience of your snack or your meal to just slow down for that first bite. And if you feel confident that you can do that and you want to even build on that and go further, try this. Try having whatever you have, like a mouthful of whatever you're having, and try completely having that and enjoying that before you move on to the next one, which, which might sound obvious to us, but actually what normally happens is we're reaching for the next one while we're still having the one we're having. So try having one at a time. Try really enjoying the first one slowly. And I'm going to ask if any of you have any thoughts or questions about any of these things that we've been doing. Oh, I just see some things on the, uh, on the chat. And Steve, if tubish fat is about trees and Sukkot about grains, what about vegetables? Yeah, good question. I don't know, Steve. I will think about that. Maybe there is a, a market for vegetables, but I don't know. Um, has anyone else got any other questions or comments on the last thing? I'm actually, uh, while, while you're doing that, I'm going to find something of relevance to share with you on the chat. Um, but I would love to hear your, uh, your comments in the meantime. Well, I'll, um, I'll answer. There was a question, a technical question about where people um, can watch this recording afterwards. I'm going to post the playlist to this series in the chat box. Um, thank you, Elaine, for pointing out that um, uh, Tavit is missing. So I will, uh, I will see to it that that one gets up as well. So by the end of the week, both this session and, and uh, Tavit will be up. Um, so let me get that in the chat. Oh, that my Jewish learning to be shot say that sounds great with Jay Michelson and Shamira Chandler. Um, I'm going to share with you all a link for instructions for mindful eating based on some sources uh, that you can see on, on the website that was mentioned earlier, Applied Your Spirituality. So you can enjoy that as well. Thank you. Um, Does that work for potato chips? <laughs> it works for everything. <laughs> <laughs> Try just to eat the first one slowly. It changes everything. Julie, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for your questions and comments. It was lovely thank learning you. with you. Thank you, Rabbi Silverstein. This was fantastic. And, and thank you again to this, um, this group, which has really been like, you know, it's, we're, we're like constellating as a group here, um, learning every month. And it's, it's really great to have you all here and, and see you all. And, and welcome to anyone who's new. Um, so I, uh, I, I see like a couple of hands waving. I don't know if that means you had a question. Um, Eileen? Um, Eileen, yeah, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I forgot to ask, do, are there more series? Because I only saw three listed. Yes, thank you. I meant to say that too. We have the next dates. So um, the next date, the next month, uh, Hebrew month is Adar. And we'll be meeting on Thursday, February 11th um, at the same time, 2 p.m. Eastern. Um, that's, I think, a few days before, uh, because Adar falls on the, on the weekend. Is that right? I, I can't remember exactly. But anyway, that's the date. Um, and then Nissan will be meeting on Thursday, March 11th. So February 11th, then March 11th, also 2 p.m. And then one more is set, um, April the 13th. Uh, ER, that's a Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern. And you'll send the email or the... Yes, yes you will. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I thought I saw another waving hand, but I don't know where it went. Okay, then. Well, um, thanks you all again, and um, wishing everyone um, a Chodesh Tov. Let's hope this month is a, a good month. Um, and yeah. everyone, uh, be well. Until next time. Chodesh Tov. Bye, Chodesh Tov. Thanks, Julie.